I caught a lot of flack on social media for this take, but I stand by it. Yes, Penn State would have beaten Ole Miss in the Peach Bowl had they not had eight starters opt out of the game. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Penn State fans? That is right. You are locked on the Nittany Lions. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Zach Seiko, bringing you all things Penn State Nittany Lions. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. So sign up today at FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Well, I said on X, formerly known as Twitter, that Penn State would have won this game if they didn't have one, two, eight starters out against Ole Miss, including another one injured. So nine impact players were not against a fully loaded Ole Miss team. And well, that's culture or next man up, the true freshman should be as good as the as the veteran starters. I, I've heard it all, and, and we're going to break it down in this episode. Plus, talk about some transfer portal news, some speculation, and Kalen King makes it official. He's declaring for the draft. Before we get to all of it, help out the channel. Subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lions on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Let me know in the comments, because I heard from all the Ole Miss fans. Believe me, I did. What about the Penn State fans? What do you think? Did Penn, Would Penn State have had a better chance against the Rebels had maybe six of those players, right? Olu Fashion or maybe Kalen King opt out. But you had not just a couple of starters, you had eight and then the ninth with Abdul Carter being injured. But let me know in the comments what you think if Penn State would have had a better chance against Ole Miss at full strength. Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, Olu Fashion, Chop Robinson were the ones that opted out fully of the game. Olu Fashion, who dressed but did not play and Chop Robinson was the first one to opt out. And then we found out last second that Kalen King and Johnny Dixon were, were not playing, period. Uh, even though we were almost a little led to believe that uh, they, they were going to play in some sort of capacity, they never ultimately did. And then Adisa Isaac, Theo Johnson, Curtis Jacobs, Caden Wallace. And this is where everyone's criticizing my point and saying, no, you didn't have that many opt outs. You're lying. Do you know how to count? I do know how to count because those guys did opt out because they were benched going into the second half or they only played a dozen snaps and were selective on certain drives. They didn't play a full game like everybody else did for Ole Miss. So yes, those count as opt outs as well. Theo Johnson, Caden Wallace, Curtis Jacobs, and Adisa Isaac essentially being phased out of the game to protect them. I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming them. I fully respect their decision because they're going on to the NFL. This Peach Bowl, unfortunately, doesn't mean anything to them other than it's a trophy in Penn State's trophy case. But personally to them, yes, it's an opportunity to play with your teammates one last time. And that's why they went through the practice and traveled with the team. They didn't just stay away. They wanted that one last game preparation, whatever you have it with with their brothers, right? But I understand protecting their interests by going to the NFL. And, and remember this, it was 20 to 17 at halftime when most of those guys were already playing selective snaps and selective drive. Then when everybody got benched, that's when it got out of control. And Abdul Carter wasn't at full strength in, in the second half either. So then there's the Abdul Carter injury. He was the glue that was holding it all together defensively because we started noticing, okay, Ole Miss is moving the football very easily, the quick tempo, but Abdul Carter was causing havoc in the backfield, was getting pressure on Jackson Dart, was able to chase people down. And then, nice little chop block that is, oh, it's clearly legal. It, it, it happened in the tackle box. I don't know the rules of football. It's a dirty play. He threw a shoulder at his, uh, they said it was at the hip. It was right into his knee. He got his ankle rolled up and he was engaged with the center. The center had an arm extended on Abdul Carter. So therefore, when you are engaged with another player and you're getting chop blocked from the blind side, that is an illegal play. That's a 15 yard penalty at a minimum. And I'd even argue an ejection. Now that's not called a penalty. 
Ole Miss eventually scores on that drive because that play comes down on a, on a fourth and three, and they ultimately score on that drive. So you take that seven points away, Penn State gets the football back, and then what? We see, we see what happens. But I was told that was a no call. That was a makeup for Ole Miss getting a touchdown taken away on Penn State's offsides. And granted, the hard count got Penn State quite a bit in that game. I, I'm not afraid to admit that. But the TD where uh, there was an offsides call, the referees blew the whistle. Everybody stopped in the middle of that play, aside from Caden Priestcorn, who caught the ball, and Jackson Dart, who threw it. Everybody either hesitated or stopped because they heard a whistle on both sides, Penn State and Ole Miss. So you can't tell me that that play should have stood. I'll tell you what the no the, the makeup call really should have been for, what that play was a makeup call for. Penn State had a ball in the red zone, one of the early drives in the game. And instead of getting a touchdown or a first and goal because there was a blatant pass interference, both Keandre Lambert-Smith and Trey Wallace tackled in front of the goal line on a double slant concept, and no foul is called, even though both receivers get turned and tackled before the ball actually makes contact with either of them. But that's a no call, but there's no makeup for that. I guess that's what the offsides is for. But then you go back to the clipping penalty, which is against the rules okay he was engaged with your center and Ole Miss's center and no call and it results in seven points for Ole Miss Ole Miss was missing three legitimate starters they had the one opt-out Cedric Johnson but Penn State had nine players missing nine is greater than three Micah Pettis, offensive lineman, I mentioned Johnson and Jordan Watkins were, were all out of this game those are impact players for for Ole Miss but to go at Penn State and say that there's a culture issue, that Penn State should have had all those players playing full 100% snaps. Aside from Dixon, everyone is leaving early for the NFL. They're foregoing their eligibility to go play pro ball. How many of Ole Miss's players are doing that in, in this cycle? All of Ole Miss's players, aside from Cedric Johnson, were either out of eligibility or returning. Jackson Dart coming back, Quinshawn Judkins, right? The majority, uh, a good a good core, their good core. Ole Miss is a good football team. I'm not here to debate that. But I'm saying if you put these two teams at full strength, Penn State would win on a neutral site. When these Penn State players have their NFL careers ahead of them, millions of dollars at risk, why play in a game that has no impact? I think the Peach Bowl is important. I think these bowl games are important. But for them personally, when agents are telling them you need to protect your career, you have assets waiting for you where you could get your look at a Jalen Smith, for example, long time ago, but had a serious injury. It affected his draft stock would have been a surefire first round pick out of Notre Dame ends up falling into the second round. Not a significant drop, but that's just one example. And then the Abdul Carter injury. What if that happened to Adisa Isaac? What if that happened to anybody else, Curtis Jacobs or somebody on the offensive side of the ball, right? Abdul Carter's returning. Those guys are not, and they're leaving early for the NFL because they've been told by scouts that, yeah, you're good. You're going to get drafted very early. So the, ne the next man up mentality, yeah, uh, your true freshmen are supposed to be as good. Your inexperienced backups are supposed to be as good as your future NFL draft picks who are starting currently. The true freshmen behind Kalen King are supposed to be able to go one-on-one -on -one with Trey Harris with no issues. All Jackson Dart did in the second half was throw one-on-one 50-50 passes against true freshman cornerbacks. That's it. Trey Harris, that's all, that's all they did. If Johnny Dixon and Kalen King are playing in this game to even half of the extent, 50% of snaps, I don't think Jackson Dart has as much confidence just throwing 50-50 balls to Trey Harris or to whoever with that same kind of confidence because Kalen King is more likely to make a play. Johnny Dixon's more likely to make a play. So yes, it should be expected that your veteran wide receiver, it, he's good, he's talented, should be able to win one-on-one -on -one matchups with inexperienced cornerbacks covering him. And then Quinshawn Judd. Quinshawn Judkins, I personally thought of him as a Heisman contender, right? I want to give credit where credit's due. But oh, Quinshawn Judkins tore up Penn State's defense. 
They had no answer for him. They couldn't stop him. He had 3.1 yards per carry against Penn State's second string defense, a bulk of it, second string defense. And that's a good outing. Well, he had over 100 yards in, in the game. It took him 34 carries to do that. So wh which is it? Because I'm not all that impressed. 100 yards is a good day, but if you take 30, 40 touches in order to get to that yard mark, that that's not a good day. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that. Ole Miss's defense on the other side gave up six yards per carry to Penn State's entire run game. If the game script didn't flip and Penn State wasn't playing from behind, Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen might have together combined for 200, 250 yards to just the two of them together. So yards per carry matters. And I, I really, I thought Judkins as one of the best running backs in the country. And you can go look at some of the previous preseason episodes that I did leading up to 2023. But Judkins did not tear up Penn State's defense. And I don't know that it looks any better in that performance when a lot of the backups were in defensively. And that's all he had, especially with garbage time. Running backs are supposed to get more yardage. He should have had 150, maybe even 200 yards, because that's what the game dictated. But instead, it was 34 carries for 105, 106 yards. Penn State's defense still hold its, held its own in run defense. But both teams at full strength. Penn State wins this one. This year, this season, 2024 is a different conversation. I think Ole Miss is a college football playoff contender next year. I do believe that. They have all the assets, they have all their assets coming back, plus what they've garnered in the transfer portal. But this season, to wrap up 2023, you have all of Penn State's players playing in this one against Ole Miss, both teams at full strength. No injuries, no opt outs. Penn State would win. Ole Miss head coach Lane Kiffin even admitted that they weren't in a position where they had to recover from a significant amount of opt-outs in this game. So call it whatever you want, culture, or that Penn State players don't buy in. Ole Miss didn't have a lot of players going into the NFL, and the one that did opted out. Penn State had eight, and all of them opted out because, yeah, they were just that good. So they felt that they didn't need to play in a bowl game that just doesn't have the same meaning as it once did. I don't blame their decisions, but let me know in the comments what you think. If two full-strength teams between Penn State and Ole Miss, if they played in 2023, who would actually win? We still got to talk transfer portal, though. We can only linger so much in the past. Penn State's got to build for the future because 2024 doesn't look as promising as it should. But there's some a couple of players in the transfer portal that are intriguing who we'll talk about on the other side of this break. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. The NFL regular season is wrapping up, but there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is super easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet like live same game parlays find bets in the new explore tab make a parlay in the parlay hub the best way to find popular parlays and so much more so visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup fanduel official partner of the nfl The Locked On Podcast Network is making history. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you. 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus the national shows covering each and every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. More transfer portal news. Well, I should say speculation for Penn State as two new players have emerged as possible contenders for Penn State to land a commitment from. We'll start with the obvious one because Penn State really needs a wide receiver. Noah Rogers. Some people might already recognize this name. Former Ohio State Buckeye. True freshman. Only played one year of college football and a former five-star. So the talent is there. The potential is there. Penn State actually had an unofficial visit with him during his initial high school recruitment. So there's already that connection, that relationship built 
with the coaching staff. He entered his name into the portal on December 31st, New Year's Eve, just last year. So Penn State makes a lot of sense here, right? Prior recruitment, needed wide receiver, playing Big Ten football. Well, we might have to pump the brakes on this one. It does make a lot of sense. However, kind of like the Andre Green situation, former North Carolina receiver returning home to play at Virginia, the Cavaliers. Well, it seems like this is a similar setup here for Noah Rogers. Noah Rogers being from North Carolina. It seemed down to Ohio State and North Carolina State out of his high school recruitment. And then there's this uh, 24-7 NC State insider already has a projection for him to return home and transfer to the Wolfpack. So there is that. There really isn't anything linking to Penn State other than that they recruited him when he was in high school. Nothing is official or has been set up and doesn't look like it's going to be that way. All signs point to NC State. But Anything can happen. Never say never, but it doesn't look that good. And Penn State is still in the same spot. Every single one of the wide receivers is expected to return until proven otherwise. Keandre Lambert-Smith has eligibility. Dante Cephas has eligibility, right? All of your starters, Trey Wallace is coming back. Liam Clifford's supposed to come back. And don't forget about Amari Evans. Don't forget about Caden Saunders, Anthony Ivey. Aside from Christian Driver, there is only one vacant spot in the wide receiver room at this time. No one's in the portal at this time. No one is declaring for the draft just yet. Again, that can all change in a, in a matter of days. And Julian Fleming is expected to verbally commit, but when? So Penn State's not exactly an ideal spot for transfer portal wide receivers looking for a new home because there's just not a lot of space. There's not a lot of room at the end right now. Uh, if Penn State had a bunch of other wide receivers already hit the portal, then it would be a different story. But when it seems like there's only one or two available spots, you're not just, you're just not going to get a lot of attention at this point. I think the spring portal, the spring season portal will have a lot more intrigue. So while Penn state still hasn't made any progress with the wide receiver position, there still is a need at offensive line. And there's one intriguing name that just recently entered into the transfer portal. Armaj Reed Adams, veteran guard, offensive tackle from Kansas, played for the Jayhawks the past few years, former three-star out of Texas, started the season at guard for nine games and then eventually moved out to tackle and started the final two on the right side of the line. And I believe that Penn State has a legitimate shot here. And why? Well, the answer is right in front of all of us, Andy Kotelnicki. That's the thing that's in common here. Andy Kotelnicki, for those who haven't seen some of my previous episodes or just don't know as much about Andy Kotelnicki, he's an offensive line guy. He's a tight ends guy. He worked closely with the tight ends at Kansas and in his previous stops was working close with the offensive line as well. So wherever he's been, he's been coaching, whether he's been an offensive coordinator, he's been coaching the O-line or the tight ends. So this one makes sense. Reed Adams in the transfer portal. Penn State has a need. There's this common mutual connection. With Andy Kotel Nicky. I mean, Penn State could be losing up to four starters on the offensive line going into 2024. It's still yet to be seen what Sal Wormley could do. Sal Wormley could come back or he could go into the NFL draft and declare. But we know that Olu Fashion, who Caden Wallace are declared for the draft early. Hunter Norzad does not have eligibility left, so he is moving on. And Penn State, so yes, there's an obvious need to tackle, so maybe he slides in at right tackle, but since he can play guard, Penn State can maneuver things. Think of J.B. Nelson, who just started this past season at left guard and played a little bit of right guard. You could move him to center, hypothetically. Maybe create some competition with Nick Dawkins. I think here, in the case of Reed Adams, you cannot pass up on an instant starter. That's the impact that he brings. And I already like Reed Adams' backstory. I like, his, I like his upcoming. He is a grinder. He came into college football at Kansas weighing 400 pounds at the beginning of his career. Then he dropped to 300. So he lost 100 pounds, and then he put on 30 pounds of muscle. That discipline, that work ethic, that goes a long way for being an offensive lineman and something that should be a must-want for Penn State and a high priority for Penn State in the transfer portal just because you do have the possibility, you're facing the possibility of replacing four starters. Guaranteed three on the offensive line, but possibly four starters. Four starters. And remember, the transfer portal does close on January 2nd. So nobody else can enter their names until that spring 
transfer portal window opens. So this is it. Nobody new can enter their name. And, and why I bring that up is because Penn State to this point has only had three names enter the transfer portal. Jace Tutty, Alex Paquetta, and Christian Driver. Only, only three names. So James Franklin, people want to talk about culture, that James Franklin doesn't have culture. He's been able to re-recruit 95, 90, what, 99% of his team here. Guys are going into the NFL draft. It makes sense because they have an opportunity to do what they've dreamed of their whole life while making millions of dollars also. Better than, yes, better than NIL, if you can believe that. But as far as rotational players, returning starters who maybe they have a better, think that they have a better opportunity somewhere else are all back for the time being. And I think that is very impressive. But speaking of NFL draft and players moving on, Kalen King has made it officially announced that he is declaring for the draft. We're going to talk about the defensive backfield and look what it looks like for Penn State. And should the alarm be sounded on the defensive backfield? That's coming up next. And if you're not an everydayer, become one. Subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lines on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts for honest conversations about Penn State football, men's basketball. We'll be talking about wrestling and men's hockey soon enough here as we're really transitioning into the winter sports season with football now officially over. But we're talking about all of it. If you want the latest analysis, you subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lines on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And I'm grateful for everyone that's helped this show climb past 2,600 subscribers now. Thank you so much as we go into 2024. So it's official. Kalen King has declared for the draft something we already knew, expected. It's just official since he put out his announcement. Most likely a day two draft pick. Originally viewed as one of the top two, top three cornerbacks to be taken in the NFL draft, possibly inside the first 15 selections. And maybe with a good pro day, a good combine, maybe he can move himself back up. But just the way... You're taking over for Joey Porter Jr. as that number one cornerback. At times, Kalen King did struggle. If Joey Porter Jr. was taken at the start of round two and Joey Porter Jr. is better than Kalen King from what we've seen collectively between the two of them in their careers at Penn State, I, I can't imagine King being selected higher at this point. So I see him as a mid to late second round pick, possibly a third round, depending on what NFL scouts are saying. But Kalen King would not go into the draft if his stock was significantly hurt that much. He is going to be a round two, round three selection at the latest. But the more important part of this, yes, you're losing Kalen King, who is an all-conference player, a multi-year starter, a veteran who would have been a leader, probably a captain going into next season. Penn State's going to be down all three starting defensive backs because they're now all officially moving on. Johnny Dixon out of eligibility, Kalen King foregoing that eligibility, Daquan Hardy not using his COVID year of eligibility, and all multi-year starters. Daquan Hardy going all the way back to 2021 where he had significant playing time. Kalen King was rotational, but Johnny Dixon, the three of them, were all starters in 2022 and all starters in 2023. That is a lot to replace, especially when now the only veteran here is Cam Miller. And Cam Miller's good. I think he has a lot of potential. James Franklin has praised him. But this is the way that next year's rotation projects. Cam Miller as your number one cornerback. So he would be guarding next year's versions of, I, I don't think there's going to be a Marvin Harrison Jr. type in the Big Ten, but number one wide receivers who are probably going to be matchup problems for any team in the conference, especially when you add the prolific offenses of Oregon, UCLA, USC, Washington, may I remind you. And then at cornerback number two, Penn State likes to operate with a one and then a 2A, 2B system for their cornerbacks. So Cam Miller will be the number one. And then Elliott Washington and Zion Tracy will probably split duties at cornerback number two. King Mack will most likely be your slot cornerback. So that's, it's all brand new. It is inexper it's inexperienced. Now, Cam Miller is the oldest player uh, of the bunch here in this case, but a lot of talent. Those players from the class of 2023 are good. You saw them in games at times. Now, did they struggle a little bit in the Peach Bowl? Yes, yes, they did. They absolutely did. But a learning experience, I still see the potential and their high school recruiting rankings. And when you talk to the players who have played alongside them in practice, back them up as well. The veterans speak highly of any of those players. What I'm anticipating, though, is Penn State and Tom Allen, too. This is where Tom Allen's influence becomes really important and why you bring someone like him in to be the defensive coordinator. 
Penn State is going to play a little bit different, probably more to more of a four two five base with multiple safeties because at the safety spot, you're loaded. You have Jalen Reed. You have Zach Key Wheatley. You have K.J. Winston. People are discussing K.J. Winston as a possible first-round pick in 2025's NFL draft, and I think people are sleeping on Jalen Reed. And remember, Zach Key Wheatley is not too far from move from being the turnover king in practice. So Penn State has the luxury of being able to just play more safeties. You don't have to play all these cornerbacks because you're limited at depth. You have question marks, but you have surefire talent at safety, and that's what you roll with. You play to your strengths. You don't try to avoid your weaknesses. But some names to watch out for because anybody could emerge. Davian Collins is, is somebody that should not be forgotten about. He could play in the slot next season. And when Terry Smith had a press conference on early national signing, I asked him, I said, hey, who are some of the young cornerbacks that are stepping up with all the likelihood that all three starters are going to be moving on? And he said, Davian Collins. So Good praise from the coaching staff. Again, Smith, someone who works very close with the defensive backs, former Mississippi State transfer, just had to get situated. I think this year almost acts as a red shirt, a, a red shirt for him just to play and observe. He could see a lot of an increased snap count in 2024. And then you have to look to the true freshman, the class of 2024 that's coming in. And the names that immediately come to mind should be John Mitchell and Antoine Belgrave Shorter. Why? Because they're both from they're both enrolling early, and they're both from Florida. So Penn State showing that they're still able to recruit down south so successfully here. But both of those guys are enrolling early. John Mitchell has a lot of athleticism, and I'm not saying that Antoine Belgrave shorter is far behind. But I would my preference would be to see John Mitchell emerge as someone who can play early on as a true freshman. Mitchell was ranked as a top ten cornerback in the nation, one of the best players out of the state of Florida. Both these corners have good talent, good speed. John Mitchell, I think, has better athleticism. He, when you when you watch his camp film, and he goes to these these scouting combines, he tests very well in the vertical. So, someone that's listed at six foot, you can put him on slot receivers. You can put him on monster receivers that are six foot four, six foot five. And there's not going to be a mismatch or anything. So hopefully John Mitchell is able to come into his own and continue to build off of what he already has as natural gifts. Penn State, they, they've been more quiet about it. It's been open about wide receiver in the transfer portal. But offensive line, defensive line, defensive backs, particularly cornerback, have been needs in what Penn State's been targeting in the transfer portal. So do not be surprised if Penn State tries to bring in at least one, maybe two cornerbacks who have veteran power four, it's not power five anymore, power four experience and, and somebody that can be a veteran leader alongside Cam Miller, even if they haven't been at Penn State for a long time. That's going to do it for this edition of Locked On Nittany Lions. Let me know in the comments what you think about that Peach Bowl. Penn State would have a chance at full strength and also how Penn State should approach the transfer portal. If there are any names that you think Penn State should try to recruit to get them to commit to Happy Valley. But for more Penn State football coverage, Men's basketball, we'll be talking wrestling and men's hockey soon enough here on the show. For all that and more, keep it right here on Locked On Nittany Lions.